Welcome back to the line. Records requests by journalists helped UNM discover that the Lobo Club, that's the fundraising arm of the athletic department, was missing $432,000 in payments. Now that's a combination of end of year accounting, state auditor investigations, and the inspection of Public Records Act requests from journalists brought about by the discovery of the uncollected funds for the use of 24 suites in the pit. Now this has caused UNM's interim president to announce that he was, quote, taking immediate action to institute stronger internal controls and more thorough oversight of the department's financial operations, end quote. That's actually, Tom Garrity, a pretty, pretty stiff response if you think about how independently, we'll get to this in a second, but how independently the athletic department has managed its, its own fundraising and payment efforts. To you, what is the bottom bottom here? Because that's a ton of dough. A couple of people have come, come forward and brought the nut down to about 388000 in the interim, but at the same time, What's been the mess here? How come this money's just been sitting out there? Well, it is a mess. And mm -hmm. by means of disclosure, I do have a client in this particular space. Okay. And I think, you know, on your intro, you mentioned that it's uncollected. Right. Um, I would say that it's uninvoiced. Uh -huh. And that is a pure mess. And that is not, and what's going to happen as a result is you're going to have companies who, uh, back in 2014 and 15, mm -hmm. Um, you know, had either a verbal agreement or not, and all of a sudden, you know, th there was no invoice, so nothing was paid. And now they're going to be outed for supporting the university as being uh, deadbeats. Mm -hmm. And that can be farther from the truth. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't tell you how many times, uh, you know, we hear stories about organizations who, you know, well, they, they didn't pay. Well, that's because they never sent them an invoice. Right. I think from an organizational perspective for the Lobo Club, mm -hmm. uh, they are in a complete mess right now. Right. I mean, to let to all of a sudden have reporters identify that you're missing $400,000 plus right. is absolutely ludicrous. Right. Um, you know, what I wouldn't be surprised, because you mentioned, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the amount of money that was raised within a couple of days of this being public, mm -hmm. is I wouldn't be surprised if there was a shakedown of some sort by the mm -hmm. Lobo Club saying, you need to pay up or else, you know, we're going to, you know, put your name out there right. and stuff. And if that's actually what happened, then, you know, the Lobo Club really should be disbanded and it shouldn't put it, be put into the UNM Foundation because that's a mess. Um, but it really should be given its own oversight directly under the uh, uh, athletic department. That's interesting. You wouldn't be alone on that, Sophie, that, that, that idea of splitting that out to get more oversight. And we're getting noise from the Lobo Club that they're open to something. Well, a, we're not quite sure what, though. I sure, sure have a laugh, 420 something thousand dollars. That's mm -hmm. almost a football coach. But, but <laughs> about beyond half a football that, coach, but beyond right. that, one of the things that's come out is that there's a key financial position within the Lobo Club that hasn't been funded and therefore hasn't been filled. Mm -hmm. I have to believe that 400 plus would allow them to put that person in place and put controls into place. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, I'm not sure that viewers of this show would be in any way surprised to hear that there were loose financial controls over the work of uh, the work of the athletic department. We've been talking about that for a really yep. long time. Yep. It's just each each piece that comes out, and then when we discover why that piece is, mm -hmm. you know, opens another door into like. What is going on there? That's a good point. What is going on there? Laura, you know, when you think about that this department has been underwater about eight of the last 10 years, that there would be a priority to get every penny in the door possible. But we hear from Lobo Club and other folks that there's been turnover, there's been, you know, institutional change, and that's all well and good, that happens. But we're talking about a long time now the stuff has gone uninvoiced, mm -hmm. if not uncollected. Um, yeah, I mean, it's... Mm -hmm. it's I think it goes back to Paul Krebs. I, mean, I know he's okay. everybody's favorite sort of scapegoat at this point. I mm -hmm. hate to kick dirt on his grave, but at the same time, you know, there's obviously some value to um, selling suites, to having suite rentals, sure. and there has to be a process for collecting that. And if it's if it's money that's going towards the athletic department, the athletic director needs to be involved in that at any right. university. Let me, let me so stop I, you I there because we do, we do have reporting out there that Mr. Krebs had sent some emails mm -hmm. to folks saying, "Hey, have we?" taken into one of the collections on this, mm -hmm. that he had actually asked folks to make this a priority and get some money, and this is just before he mm -hmm. either resigned or jettisoned mm -hmm. or whatever you want to call it. So I hear your point, though, but he tried, it looked like. So and where so was the follow through, though? That's right. I mean, so sending an email, I mean, is important. It's an important first step. It's a right. preliminary thing. But there has to be some process. So I think what the, what the interim president right now has done mm -hmm. in appointing Chris Vallejos to do this, um, to do the oversight on all this is a good thing because he has a good reputation. Mm -hmm. um, he's actually been on the board of KNME before. Um, and he has been at UNM since 1986. He right. oversees a very large, about 700 employees at the university, um, a lot of different budgets. And mm -hmm. I think that's the person with the right kind of skills to, to try to figure out what's happening here and institute some process that will 
you know, make us whole again as far as uh, the sweets go. But yeah, mm -hmm. it's, and I agree with Tom. I mean, I don't think that anybody should be shamed into um, paying for this because right. if they weren't invoiced and there was nothing in writing, that I'm not sure that they have an obligation to pay. Right. Now, they may want to um, just because they, you know, initially went into it and, and wanted to be a supporter of the of athletics. But, mm -hmm. but I think it's a serious problem in terms of enforcement if somebody decides they're not going to pay for it or maybe they never actually used the That's suites. Right. Um, to then and now it seems to me as well, uh, Merritt, that now they're going to invoice people for, for, for seasons going back to 2010, 2011. Now the nut is huge if you're talking about 40, 35 to 45 grand. You're going to have to make some deals with people because a lot of folks around here are not going to cover that in one check. Right. Do you see what I mean? That's yes. going to be a, a mess. Let me talk about this as well, and I want to get y'all's opinion on this as well. A lot of angst I hear out there is the relationship between the university and the foundation. And the foundation is claiming, look, we don't fall under the auspices of, of open records acts, you know, as, because we're not a state entity. But at the same time, we have the AG in it now, and we have, you know, you know what I'm saying? We have everybody in it now looking for answers. Is that going to last to you? I mean, that, you can do that, but for so long, now that people are looking for answers, I'm not quite sure on that one. Just because you're a nonprofit doesn't mean you're not subject to the law and uh, financial best practices. Mm -hmm. So uh, certainly, I would, I would think, um, uh, e even as a nonprofit, they're certainly um, uh, accountable for uh, uh, judicious use of the funds they're, they're bringing in. Mm -hmm. And what, what I, I, I find all the opinions at this table are uh, so, uh, to me, spot on on this. UNM is supposed to be our flagship university. Mm -hmm. And for student athletes, this is a big deal. You know, $400,000 for luxury suites. Yeah, that's, um, that's a big deal. But let, let's look at um, the sports teams that have been shut down and the mm -hmm. scholarships that have been lost. Yes. Um, we brought in a big name football coach who's doing his best and ticket sales are still down. There's something functionally wrong, mm -hmm. not just um, in the athletic director's office, but clearly uh, things are not working correctly in the athletic department. And it's a shame because it's hurting the brand. Lobos are our team. Right. That's all we got. We don't have professional sports. And then if you take the community boosters who are buying the suites, you haven't invoiced them and you let, you let the press out them, ah, this is going to be a lot of damage control, right. both with regard to PR and with financial And management. there's an IPRA out there by the journal, Tom, looking for the names of those folks, and that's going to happen. So, mm -hmm. uh, But touch on this idea of the relationship between the foundation, the rest of the university, and the Lobo Club being under the foundation's auspices, so to speak. Can that last, this kind of secrecy, so to speak? I mean, they're not trying to be secret but just hiding behind the fact that you don't, they don't have to do certain things. Yeah, and see, there's, uh, you know, have to do and want to do. And I think that the UNM Foundation has had a number of different opportunities to mm -hmm. do, you know, to say, well, we don't have to do that. I think they've, uh, is long gone, long past, that they want to be transparent and gotcha. want to be able to show, you know, what that spirit of cooperation is as far as saying, you know, we're not going to be a place where you can launder money. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is a place where, you know, we are a big supporter of the university. We're proud of what we do. And here are the folks who are also proud of supporting the university through the foundation. So I, I think that there's an opportunity, has been an opportunity for the foundation to kind of come clean. Uh, they decided not to for a that's variety right. of different reasons, and that's their prerogative, but I sure. don't think perception is going to let them do that much longer. Right, right, right. So if we pick up on that, if you so would, you know, foundation. It's actually not uncommon at universities and with other large nonprofits and even sometimes with governmental entities, you know, more traditional governmental entities to have something like the foundation. Um, the foundation, because it is not part of state government, it's, mm -hmm. it's um, set up separately, has more freedom to do the things, and this is what they would argue in this case, to do the things that are necessary in order to raise funds, mm -hmm. to keep funds from being pulled out of the foundation for what they were given for right. and used for other state functions, Fair things enough. like that. You know, that, so there is, right. there is, I think, longstanding and widespread um, understanding that there can be real value in having that kind of, of entity. I, I imagine that the foundation feels some concern, and I, and I think that this idea is going to be tested by the AG's office over the next year or so, mm -hmm. some concern that there will be a moment that the courts say, well, it looks like a duck, it talks like a duck. Thank you. Yeah. Right. And, and so um, they have to be concerned. I, I think it's possible that they're saying, we're not responding to IPRA requests because that makes us look like a part of the government and we can't look like partners. I'm not giving them advice. Sure, sure. It's a fair but, argument though. But sure. I, you know, I sort of look at that and it's like you can create real PR problems when you're just focused on what is the le real legal issue and you can create real legal problems if you just focus on what's the PR issue. That Good point. puts them in a bind. Good point. That's all the time we have with that one. When we come back to the line, we'll talk about the Secretary of State's stand on turning over voter information.